Okay. And another reminder that I wanted to let you know is that we have interpretation service. So you can push the global button below Zoom and you can change from Spanish to English. I'm going to be switching to to different the different languages in the in the meeting, but you can just click the interpretation button and, and access that service. So again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, as I was telling you, we as a whole team are covering different time zones and different regions to celebrate Open Data Month. We already had sessions for Latin, Latin America and North America last week. And this is the Europe and Africa session. And next week we are going to host the Asia Pacific one. We did a first round of these Open Data Open House events in 2003 and, and last year. And we wanted to open up the game again to our community to get to know new projects and different projects. So we want to see what's new and what's possible with open data in these regions, uh, exchange open data principles and policies and projects. And especially in this session, we are going to explore the dialogue between open data and data protection. We are going to hear initiatives on gender data and also in equitable and fair uh, artificial intelligence with, that are topics that are really important in the global context right now. So we are really, really excited about now, about that. And as you may know, these events are an extension of our implementation working group sessions. We meet always on a monthly basis with our community of adopters and endorsers to discuss best practices and implementations and hot topics happening uh, in open data around the world. So uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to give a, a huge welcome to our new implementation working group government co-chair that is going to be joining the implementation working group sessions from april on he's here uh, right now today his name is joseph tansi he's a senior product manager at the department for leveling up housing and communities in the uk shows passion lies in using digital technology to unlock data through the planning housing and land ecosystem and his current focus is on making data accessible and usable to support the modernization of england's planning system show has recently also supported the delivery of prop tech innovation fund which is the largest uk government prop tech program and continues to support local authorities to leverage digital innovations and gain better access to their data so we are really happy that the show is going to to coordinate the implementation working group from April on, and we are going to learn a lot from his experience. Thank you so much, show, for being here today. Okay. Amazing. Thank so, you, Renato. Um, just want to say hello to everyone. Yeah. Really looking forward yeah. to working with you all over the next couple of months ahead. And um, yeah, look forward to starting again in April. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. And now we don't have a lot of time, so we are going to jump right, right straight into the session. We, are, we have a, an amazing panel of speakers today. I'm going to tell you a little bit of the, of the dynamic. We are going to have 10 minutes for each speaker. Uh, please feel free to, to present yourself in the chat or to leave any question you may have. This is the most pretty packed session of the of the Open Data House uh, month that we are running because we wanted to have at least two speakers from each region. So we are going to be running a little bit. Hopefully we can address some questions in the end, but if we don't have enough time, we are, we are also happy to receive uh, questions through email or take the questions that we have in the chat. So I'm going to present our speakers. We are going to have, we are, we are having here today Le uh, Leticia Rodriguez Rivera from the government of Catalonia, Christoph Izdevsky, who works in Open Spending Coalition e EU, Mushiri Engia, who is the executive director of the Local Development Research Institute, and Bobina Sulfa, who is a researcher on data and digital rights from policy. So we are going to start right now with our first speaker that is Leticia Rodriguez and I'm going to switch to Spanish to present her so you can remember that you have the interpretation button below. 
Así que bueno, tenemos aquí a Leticia Rodríguez Riera. Leticia es, es jefe de datos abiertos de la Generalitat de Cataluña, es licenciada en comunicación y MBA por el SADE y ha sido responsable de comunicación y de marketing en el sector público y privado. En la administración pública ha sido responsable de comunicación en, en organizaciones del Departamento Interior, llevando a cabo proyectos tanto de comunicación externa como interna. Y desde el 2016 lidera el proyecto de datos abiertos de seguridad pública que vio la luz pocos años más tarde, logrando abrir más de 50 conjuntos de datos, situando a la Generalitat de Cataluña referente en la apertura de datos. Desde el año pasado es responsable de datos abiertos de la Generalitat, donde sigue trabajando impulsando la apertura de datos públicos como parte del gobierno del dato que están implementando, además de participar en redes de colaboración y proyectos de datos del sector público-privado. Y la presentación que nos va a compartir hoy es eh, sobre el inventario de datos de la Generalitat de Cataluña. Así que Leticia, es, eh, el espacio es tuyo. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Renato, y sí, muchas gracias por eh, ofrecernos la oportunidad de explicar este proyecto que ha sido tan importante y decisorio y que es un punto de partida para la implementación del gobierno del dato en el gobierno de la Generalitat de Cataluña. Voy a pasar a presentar la, a compartir la presentación. Muy bien. Bueno, pues como os comentaba, el inventario de datos en la Generalitat de Cataluña fue el punto de partida para la implementación del gobierno del dato en nuestra organización. Y comentaros antes de todo que el proyecto eh, se marca en un proceso de transformación de nuestra administración. Estábamos en un momento, eh, cuando se empezó el proyecto, en que se estaba yendo hacia la transición de una administración electrónica hacia una administración digital y y también a una administración inteligente, que es el nuestro reto, donde los datos eh, son un activo estratégico y que nos permitirán repensar muchos trámites para hacerlos mucho más eficientes y útiles para la ciudadanía. Así como todos sabemos, los datos eh, son una valiosa fuente de información para ayudar a nuestras organizaciones a tomar decisiones informadas, mejorar la eficiencia, la competitividad y proporcionar eh, mejores productos y servicio a, a las personas a las que nos debemos. ¿no? Y por eso es importante que nuestras organizaciones eh, tengan asegurado el gobierno, la gestión y la calidad de los datos. Estamos pues ante un cambio de paradigma en lo que es, estamos buscando de organizaciones más cohesionadas que trabajen de forma más coordinada y que estén orientadas al dato para maximizar la explotación de los datos para mejorar los servicios que prestamos. ¿no? Para ello, la Generalitat de Cataluña, esta para hacer esta transformación, se dotó de una serie de instrumentos normativos, instrumentos jurídicos, que permiten llevar a cabo esta transformación. Así, en 2020 eh, se publicó el Decreto de Administración Digital que sitúa el gobierno de los datos como eje vertebrador de un nuevo modelo de administración. Y además, este decreto lo que permitió es definir e implantar o definir las bases que permitirían implantar posteriormente el modelo del gobierno del dato basado en la gestión del dato. ¿no? Y aparte también, otro de los instrumentos de los que nos dotamos es un acuerdo de gobierno que básicamente lo que pretende es fijar eh, de forma ya más concreta los objetivos, ejes, estrategia de este gobierno del dato y concretar el sistema de organización que lo haría posible. ¿no? Volviendo pues al, al proyecto, eh, Estamos, nos situamos en 2020 ¿no? y en la situación que, que comentábamos era que no había una suficiente conexión entre todos los departamentos, todas las unidades, los datos de la administración estaban dispersos y en definitiva faltaba poder tener una imagen de exactamente cuál era, cuáles eran los datos de los que disponíamos y qué, de qué naturaleza eran. ¿no? Así pues, el proyecto del inventario, y ahora ya entramos un poco más en detalle en, el, en, en, Leticia, en su contenido. Solo, 
Solo un comentario que no sé, no sé si estás cambiando slides, pero no se está Sí. moviendo en este momento. Ah, no se está moviendo Ah. en este momento. Tal vez conviene poner pantalla completa. Sí, Porque estoy en se pantalla ha, completa. ah, se ha quedado. ¿Se ha quedado? Sí, 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 o volver estoy a cambiando. o volver a compartir, tal vez. A ver, un momento. Si no, puedo intentar compartir Sure. yo y, y luego. Voy a intentar. Disculpad, cosas de la técnica. Ahora Sí, estáis no pasa viendo nada. la portada. La portada, exacto. Sí. Y No, lo veis. se queda ahí. ¿Se Se queda? queda ahí, pero claro, porque, porque no, no, no pasa la pantalla completa. Si no se puede ver así pequeño, pequeño va Así cambiando, pequeño. sí. Bueno, pues Mejor. vale. Gracias. Bueno, siento la, los inconvenientes. <ríe> Ningún problema. Muchas gracias. Bueno, pues eh, situándonos ya en lo que es el inventario de datos, eh, es un proyecto que tiene como finalidad convertirse en un repositorio de todos los conjuntos de datos de la Generalitat de Cataluña. Este repositorio lo que nos permite es obtener información descriptiva sobre todos los conjuntos de datos, de forma que podemos identificar de qué tipo son, el formato que, en el que están las fuentes de origen, Eh, y además obtener una visión muy simplificada, muy transversal, de forma que todos los equipos que trabajen con datos o que necesiten trabajar con datos puedan consultar de forma fácil e intuitiva todo aquello que está disponible para su uso. ¿no? Y además lo que nos permite es tomar decisiones a partir de todos estos datos del inventario. Por ejemplo, y en el campo que nos ocupa, es cómo, cuántos datos tenemos que se puedan abrir, que están parcialmente abiertos y que hay que, o los que no están abiertos y que se puedan publicar como datos abiertos, eh, cuáles son aquellos datos que efectivamente no se pueden publicar pues porque contienen datos personales y están sujetos a las limitaciones eh, de la normativa de protección de datos personales o inclusive cuáles son los datos que representan eh, un alto valor o que eh, pueden proporcionar un alto valor a la sociedad. ¿no? Sí, a, a nivel de cronología del proyecto, estamos hablando de que es un proyecto que se inició en 2020 y se alargó hasta finales de 2023. Eh, se estructuró en dos fases, una primera de lanzamiento Uh, una, una, a continuación se hizo el despliegue en todos los departamentos y en la última fase se hizo una ampliación a los conjuntos de datos de entidades del sector público. Es decir, inicialmente se hizo en lo que es la estructura del gobierno de la Generalitat y más adelante en las empresas públicas. Y además también nos <coughs> sirvió para hacer eh, el gobierno de un conjunto de datos que se ya, si acaso lo podríamos explicar en una futura ocasión. Um, para eso, para hacer, eh, como veis, es un proyecto amplio, eh, pero también muy complejo, con lo cual eh, hubo que realizar toda una serie de actividades de planificación, de cálculos de las volumetrías basándose en distintos criterios para poder dimensionar el volumen de cada uno de los departamentos y así calcular la duración estimada del inventario en cada uno de ellos, la priorización. Se hicieron también, por ejemplo, eh, una identificación con una propuesta de las unidades a involucrar, la identificación del equipo de trabajo, recopilación previa de información de la que ya disponíamos. ¿no? Por ejemplo, los conjuntos de datos que ya sabíamos que estaban publicados en datos abiertos o que teníamos como registro de actividades de tratamiento de datos personales. E incluso ya se pudo... realizar toda una serie de o, o plantear toda una serie de trabajo ya realizado para que cuando se llevasen a los departamentos se pudiese, no se partiese de un lienzo en blanco, ¿no? que siempre es más complicado. También se hicieron una gran e intensiva actividad de comunicación interna para asegurar que las direcciones de todas las unidades estaban alineadas con el, con el proyecto que, como sabemos siempre, que son factores decisivos en el éxito y en, el, en el, la, la consecución de los objetivos que buscamos. ¿no? Hay que también comentaros que eh, es un proyecto que se inició inicialmente, como veis en pantalla, en 12 departamentos, pero a lo largo del, del proyecto tuvimos un cambio de gobierno, un cambio de 
estructura y de 12 departamentos pasamos a 14, pero así todo se consiguió re, redirigir la, la actuación. ¿no? Así, el catálogo del inventario lo que tuvimos pues, fue primero una identificación de todos estos datos con el que se elaboró el inventario, se cargaron todo, todo lo que es el inventario en una herramienta colaborativa y donde eh, los usuarios pueden acceder para consultar toda la información y además, de forma muy fácil, se puede ver en un cuadro de, de mando todos los indicadores y hacer eh, toda una serie de búsquedas. En resumen... En resumen, como os comentábamos, el, el inventario de datos se realizó en 14 departamentos, 67 entidades del sector público. En este proyecto participaron más de mil personas, se realizaron más de 500 sesiones de trabajo y en, al final de estos tres años conseguimos identificar 3.500 eh, conjuntos de datos. Pero además también se realizó un análisis posterior para profundizar en el, contenido, en el contenido de los conjuntos de datos identificados que nos permitiese priorizar futuras aperturas en base a distintos criterios. ¿no? El interés que podía tener, si estaban asociados o no a algún sistema de, de información, la tecnología con la que disponían, la calidad de los datos, etc. En definitiva, y como comentábamos al principio, el inventario de datos supuso un cambio cultural. Es el punto de partida para la implementación del gobierno del dato eh, y permitió que toda la organización y las personas que participaron en este proyecto tomesen conciencia de que los datos son un activo común de la organización, no individual, que los datos hay que tenerlos bien trabajados porque si no, de lo contrario, no son tratables. Y se han generado muchas conexiones de colaboración entre equipos del mismo uh, departamento y, en definitiva, se ha tomado más conciencia del valor y la importancia de los datos. Muchas gracias. Leticia, muchas gracias por compartir con nosotros esta presentación. Eh... Bueno, luego si los speakers están de acuerdo con, la, con el Implementation Working Group se pueden compartir las, las slides para, para, sí. por, por, ese, por esos momentos en los que ha fallado, así que si, si no hay problema uh -huh. luego lo compartimos claro. con la comunidad. Eh, nada, muy interesante escuchar sobre todo este, esta, esta visión transversal para poder identificar y tener en claro los datos de alto valor, los datos, los datos abiertos y los datos que requieren técnicas de protección de, de, de datos personales. Me quedo con, con esta visión transversal e integral de todo el trabajo que vienen haciendo a través de, de estos años. Muchísimas gracias y voy a cambiar gracias. nuevamente a, a inglés. I'm switching to English again to present Christoph Istepsky, our next speaker. He's a co-lead at the Open Spending e EU Coalition and is a legal and policy officer at the Stefan Battery Foundation in Poland. Um, he's a fellow of a uh, member of the OECD Innovation Citizen Participation Network and he's a lawyer specialized in access to public information, reuse of public sector information, and relations between technology and democracy. He has wide expertise in relations between public administrations and citizens, and he's the author of several papers on transparency and open data. He also, he's also specialized in legal aspects of the prevention of corruption, and he's going to share today a, pre a presentation on opening spending data, struggling with personal data protection and politicians' comfort. I think that the, the dialogue and the balance between open data and data protection is a super interesting topic and I, I would like to, to hear from Christoph uh, how this operates in, in a specific topic like open spending and open procurement. So thank you so much for sharing this with us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for invitation. I'm uh, very happy to be able to present some of our work uh, that uh, we are doing at the Open Spending uh, EU Coalition uh, just to check whether you see my presentation so far. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we were actually the, just a few words about the Open Spending EU Coalition. This is a non-formal network of uh, over 40 organizations and individuals, uh, activists, academics, journalists, that would like to see uh, EU funds being more open and more transparent to, uh, to the people for different reasons, of course. So we have different, I would say, different stories why the 
uh, data should be open. Of course, from the journalistic point of view, it would be uh, covering corruption stories, for example, of analyzing the, the, the general spending of, of the governments, including those from the European Union uh, budget. Uh, for us as an activist, um, and uh, I would say the main aim of the uh, coalition is to have uh, open, fair and accountable public spending in the EU, meaning that we want to prepare a ground, a base, a fundament for uh, people who would like to use the data or needs the information on public spending. And although um, we are mostly uh, consisted of the journalists, academics and activists, as I was saying, we are cooperating with uh, uh, public um, officials, uh, with public institutions. We have uh, also a kind of a parallel network of uh, uh, people working in uh, public procurement offices uh, around uh, the EU, because uh, this is also in the interest of the public, as Leticia was saying, actually, this is also in the interest of the public officials. Uh, to have an access uh, to um, uh, information. Um, so saying this, we are concentrated basically on three main issues, um, which is the um, uh, EU open data, and we work heavily towards uh, convincing the European Commission, because this is uh, the primary responsibility of the European Commission, uh, to include uh, uh, public spending and public procurement as the um, uh, high value data sets uh, according to the open data, data directive. Uh, high value data sets, very shortly, uh, high value data sets are the data sets or the data that uh, has a high value to the society. But uh, what is interesting as important is actually that the European Commission can oblige member states uh, to um, uh, uh, submit them or publish them in the open data formats, um, which will mean that actually we will, if it happens, of course, and uh, unfortunately we have to probably wait for the, for the new um, uh, for the new commission after elections in, in June, um, uh, um, which will basically mean that we will have a single market of transparency. As, as you may aware, uh, not even the people from, from the European Union, there is a single market uh, concept for, for everything, but unfortunately not for transparency. And this is the part of our work is that if you want to really understand how the European Union works, how the public spending works, you have to be able to analyze and have an access uh, to the data from member states in the similar formats and uh, with uh, the similar data fields, basically. So uh, this is something that we, I will, I will, come back to, to, to the issue a bit a bit earlier. Uh, we also um, uh, are interested in um, showing the case why the open data, why the open spending is important in, in the in the in the in the EU budget uh, and, and generally uh, on, on the level of, of public finances. And we use the uh, one of the mechanism, financing mechanism, um, uh, from the EU, which are the uh, recovery funds. Recovery funds are the funds that uh, the European Union distributed among member states after the pandemics. Uh, and everyone knows about it. We don't have to, you know, very often when we talk about open data, when we talk why it is important, it's like for a lot of people it's complicated. But that's why also be using uh, this example, because there are a lot of money being poured there. This is one of the biggest uh, funds uh, covered by the EU budget. Uh, but also the people are kind of understanding uh, why it is important because uh, member states and the citizens eventually they're getting this um, uh, this, uh, this 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 money. Uh, but also, as you can see uh, in the in the middle, and I hope you can see my presentation actually, uh, that uh, we also work on the company ownership. There is a, a very interesting case we had um, now almost two years ago in in the European Union. Uh, where the European Court of Justice said that, unfortunately, there is no possibility of uh, having an access uh, to the beneficiary ownership um, uh, data. Um, uh, it's, it, it can be only accessible by the people who have a, a legitimate aim. Um, and uh, we do believe, and this is part of our, our struggle, I would say, that also there is a legitimate aim to access the personal data on company owners, on beneficial owners, if, at least, if they are the part of the public procurement process, of the public spending process. So if 
if the person or the, the, the company and the representative or the owners uh, are um, a part of the public contracting, so they are one of the parties of the contract with the public entity, their data should be published uh, for the sake of transparency, but also for the sake of uh, being able to analyze if there are no um, uh, no examples of, of uh, irregularities. Um, so I'm just looking at my uh, watch and my, my stopper. So, uh, so basically, yes, this is this is something that that we discuss heavily. We are co cooperating with TIA, uh, Transparency International Secretariat. They are, have a extremely important work on the general access to beneficial ownership. So not only to uh, those the data on those companies that are uh, um, a part of the public contracts, but more general, but uh, this is uh, this is something that is very important for us. And also we try to engage um, the, um, um, or, or try to implement this, this principle of, of having a data on final recipients, uh, also in open, open data, in this uh, recovery plan. So unfortunately, when the recovery plans were uh, implemented by the European Commission um, already three years ago, we realized that there are no transparency provisions. So basically, uh, there are there is no provision that says that every country should um, uh, should um, uh, make available data on how the money are being spent, to whom uh, it, it goes. And one of our, as you can see, we, we, we made a special guidance actually for the member states how to, uh, how to do it. Um, uh, that uh, included the uh, open, um, uh, the, the information on the, uh, um, on the uh, beneficiaries, the final recipients. We had some sort of the of the success because uh, then a year ago the commission together with the european parliament decided that actually they will publish the list of the 100 biggest recipients of re recovery plans and we were like pretty happy we can have later discussion why 100 it's it's a relevant question uh, but uh, but this was a decision of the parliament and the commission the 100 biggest recipients uh, but eventually what we actually understood a bit later that the interpretation of the commission was that the final recipients are not actually the final final recipients as contractors and subcontractors but only the, uh, the the institutions that got the money. So uh, if there is a contractor or subcontractor, still we don't know it. And still it's a part of our struggle because what the commission were saying because of GDPR. So this regulation that regulates the, the, the personal data uh, protection. Um, so also in our works, we try to check how countries actually are fulfilling this obligation. And as you can see, only one country haven't submitted any, any data, but not only we are, we are looking into the information, what kind of a data are being um, uh, submitted, but also whether there are in the open data formats. And as you can see, it's uh, it's uh, it's it, it goes it goes pretty well. And um, also, I mean, in in, in terms of, of this balance between the personal data and the public spending transparency, I, I can uh, um, uh, recommend you the, the article that uh, we 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 did together with my colleague Rachel Hanna. Uh, it's available on the Open Data Charter blog. Uh, but also, if you are interested in um, uh, monitoring of public uh, spending and also from the perspective whether there are in the open data formats, you can uh, check out some of our tools. Uh, this is actually, sorry, like made for the Europeans in terms, this is the tool that we did for the people who want to assess whether the member state is actually doing something um, more transparent than is required to do in terms of spending the recovery funds. So as you can see, uh, we are also um, uh, asking uh, whether the final recipi recipient, um, um, which is a legal person, whether there is a, there is a, uh, the, uh, not, not only the legal person, but um, also the, uh, the individuals, uh, the, the name and the identity. So at least to be able to identify the people who who got the money. So still this struggle is very important. If you want to have uh, more information, please visit our site or uh, get engaged on, on, on Twitter or please do contact me. And yes, of course, uh, uh, Renato, you can share my presentation with uh, with people. Maybe uh, I will add uh, um, this uh, direct link to the, the blog I was I was taking, telling about and I'm looking forward for uh, next speakers and uh, more discussion about what I said in this speedy dating open data.
uh, event. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christoph. This has been really interesting to get to know a little bit more about the, the dialogue between access to information and personal data protection that are both human rights and shouldn't one shouldn't exclude each other. And also to hear about specific tools and reports you have developed and the, and the specific cases on beneficial ownership and the recovery funds. So really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. We are going now with our next speaker, Muchiri. Muchiri is a co-founder and executive director of the Local Development Research Institute, an action-oriented think tank supporting efforts to Af of African countries to take practical evidence-informed actions to end extreme poverty and hunger and reduce inequalities. Muchiri has worked in data technology and innovation for development for more than 24 mm -hmm. years, 14 of which have been spent focusing on mission-driven governance, improving availability of data for decision-making, and strengthening open government in Africa. In this context, he has led research and implementation teams working in food security, nutrition, artificial intelligence, and good governance. And he's also our vice chair board in the, in the Open Data Charter. So he's going to present uh, the name of his presentation is Political Will for Gender Data in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we are happy to hear you. The floor is yours, Muchiri. Thank you. Thank you, Renato. And thank you to um, Leticia and, and, uh, and uh, Christophe for your presentations. Um, I, 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 to, a large, to a large extent, they speak to some of the issues that, that I'll be discussing today, to one extent, actually. Um, and I, I believe it's going to be um, a, a useful insight uh, for, for all of us. So I'll just switch these to presentation mode. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it full screen now, yeah. So, uh, so just a short, uh, short intro. Uh, the Local Development Research Institute is a uh, action-oriented uh, think tank. We're very much on the implementation research side of things. Uh, we support African countries in their efforts to implement practical and evidence-informed actions to address hunger, poverty, and inequality. And because evidence is such a big part of our work, data is a, a type of evidence that we really prioritize and we work around uh, a lot. Our work is in food security, artificial intelligence, primary healthcare, um, and in governance. So it, uh, you see our, our, our presence in, in many of these spaces. Um, and when it comes to inequality, uh, one of the uh, focus areas for us is, is, uh, is the issue of gender and the inequality that uh, presents itself in, in, uh, in, in the context of, of, of gender. So um, in the last year, my colleagues, uh, Amina and, and Felicia, have worked on two pieces of research uh, to understand, on one, on one, on one hand, the, uh, what, what the political will uh, looks like for, for gender data, uh, as, as we identify, as we've identified in the past, that political will is, a, is an important ingredient, an important, an important precursor even for the emergence of strong uh, data ecosystems. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, looking at what the capacity is for institutions that are working around um, uh, around data, uh, or in or with the sectors that we feel particularly require mature data ecosystems. So um, this this uh, this particular uh, presentation is, is mostly around the work we did on, on political will. Um, we looked at twenty African countries. It's part of a broader uh, project uh, that looked at uh, thirty countries globally. Uh, the, this the report for this work and the global synthesis report are online. I'll put I'll share the links um, on the on the chat, um, and we'll be happy to hear from you your thoughts uh, in the chat. And and afterwards, feel free to reach out, um, even as we explore the next uh, scale up for for the kind of work that we want to do in this area. Um, so as I mentioned, this was a qualitative study in twenty African countries, um, and they spanned Anglophone, Francophone, Lusophone. Uh, we try to get a, a broad, uh, broad spectrum. These are also many of the countries where LDRI has country researchers that work on some of the research areas we, we conduct. So the selection criteria was also partly based on, uh, on our existing presence in, in these countries. Um, 
The questions we asked were in these broad three categories. One around resource mobilization. And this is mostly because we're interested in the extent to which countries are investing their own resources um, for, uh, for, for data, uh, but particularly also around, around, around gender data. So domestic resources are a big issue uh, that we looked at. Uh, we looked at technical capacity. Um, so these are areas where the countries either have great strengths or, or challenges on collection, analysis, uh, dissemination, extracting insights. Um, and this is also that relationship, that technical relationship between the experts and the policymakers on one hand, because that's, that can be an important interface um, and one that causes some challenges for, for those working on the technical side. And the third area that we looked at was youth. Um, so thinking about that interface between technical experts um, and, and policymakers, um, and consequently also how the data is used to uh, make that uh, 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 information more useful to, to those who need to make decisions. Uh, this, this then becomes an important area to look at. And because we're also very implementation focused, this is an area that we, we look at a great deal. You know, is, is the data available? Uh, is it available and actionable? Um, so political will, uh, you know, this is such a fluid concept, it could mean anything. Um, in, in this case, we were using this definition. Um, gender data, uh, political will for gender data refers to the commitment and determination uh, of governments and policymakers to collect, analyze, and use data that specifically addresses gender issues. Um, so we went further to try and understand what the what the domains would be that we'd be looking at, and and so we 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 uh, structured our our research and our study um, in in trying to discover um, things within these five major areas. First of all, what definition is being used for gender data in in our country? Are we on the same page when we say gender data, uh, or do or do countries um, have, have a different working definition from, from other countries. This is important when you're trying to figure out if you're, if you're both talking about apples or whether you're apples and oranges. Um, then we want to find out what the governing frameworks look like. Um, governing frameworks tend to exist due to a political uh, process. Um, so they could, they could be an interesting uh, signal for the extent to which there is real political will at a macro level. And then of course, financing. Again, an area where there is extreme political contestation because resources are limited. Um, and therefore, you know, who wins in the shuffle can tend to signal where the where the greatest interests are and where countries are willing to put and leaders are willing to put their political energy. Um, and then of course we're looking at the use of that gender data for, for decision making. How what's the extent to which it is used? Um, is it usable? Um, and then our stakeholders. Uh, coordinated and, and brought together in the development, the collection, analy analysis, and dissemination of, of, um, of, of gender data in the country. So um, really quickly, th this, these are the, the overall high-level findings here. And I want to probably preface this by saying, when we when we talk about open data, and, and LDRI works with open data a lot, and, and, and we've done so for a number of years, there are certain assumptions that carry uh, our work in, in most in most places around the world, and I'm, I'm assuming most of us as well. Um, and sometimes we assume that the capacity exists, that the data can be there. Um, and sometimes we can distill this down to some very basic um, ideas that, you know, uh, we need to put more investments, we need to build technical capacity, we we'll look for the data portals, where are the portals? Put up the portals, let's see the data. Uh, but the, the two big pieces that sometimes are invisible to us, and, and one has to do with the political will, for instance, and you see this in, a, in, the, in the work that you're talking about, uh, it's almost impossible to do if you don't have uh, the, the kind of political buy-in that you need. And the work that's been done at the level of the European Commission, um, you know, whether it's GDPR or, or spending, procurement, et cetera, that, that layer of political in, intention and the determination to implement is a really important signal. Um, so that's, I have to preface that, you know, these next five um, slides with, with that, just so that you get, a, you get to understand why, we, we, why we're prioritizing this particular lens, this political lens for the work that we're doing. Um, so defining gender data. I think one of the things that we found is that gender data is, is often interchangeably used with the idea of sex disaggregation, and that's not 
all that it is. Um, the, the gender issues that you'd want to see reflected um, so that the data can be used to address the issues affecting women and girls um, sometimes go beyond just disaggregating a data set by, 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 by sex. Um, so having this uh, uh, broader and, and more um, comprehensive understanding of what gender data is, is, is extremely important because then it carries through into how the translation happens in policy, it, it carries through into how translation happens into financing. You know, what then shall we put um, money behind? If we don't do that, then the diversity that exists, the nuances that exist between men and women, boys and girls, can tend to be uh, left out. And then the data collection goes on to pick up that bias, that um, that that absence of, of diversity into the data collection. The end result is that you do end up with data that isn't um, uh, adequate for, for addressing the issues facing, facing women and girls. Women and men, boys and boys and, and, and girls, and that's that's a really important thing. So, the 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 the, the more we we restrict our understanding to just sex disaggregation, the more we fail to do justice to to the issue. And that that was something that we saw that was very common across um, across many countries. Um, when it comes to governing frameworks, this is an area that 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 we looked at um, what, at the gender issues level. Uh, you know, ending child marriage, uh, uh, gender-based violence, uh, you know, teen pregnancies, etc. You do find that uh, there are policies in place, there are gender equality policies in place. Many countries have legislation, um, uh, the gender statistics units or departments within national statistics offices are now fairly standard. Um, so that level of governing infrastructure is going a great, it's going a, 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 quite a distance in, in many countries. And uh, gender focal points have become a really big part of it. And um, part of this uh, research was possible because we worked closely with uh, the gender uh, data focal points in, in these countries were part of the Africa Gender Data Network, uh, which is, which is uh, 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 hosted and supported by Data2X and Pi21 and, and, and other partners. Um, and it, it's a really important uh, a, a collective of reformers and champions for gender data across the national statistics. Uh, system. Uh, and these focal points are, are, are there. So at the governing frameworks, we, we're not doing badly, uh, but we do have a, a big gap when it comes to the actual um, governing of gender data specifically. Um, so that's that's still an area that requires a bit more a bit more work. Um, and and uh, the, the the tactics and strategies that um, um, and, and, Kate uh, talks, talks about in the Global Synthesis Report, kind of show you how countries are, are trying to address that uh, in, in either beginning to or contemplating how to approach uh, that particular problem. Um, and then there's a big, the big issue of financing. Um, this, this is an area where if, if, if data doesn't just make it out by pure magic, uh, investments need to be made and that money needs to come from somewhere. Um, Almost across the board, the primary source of that money has tended to be development partners, um, and that that does create uh, certain challenges for sustainability um, and, con and continuity when it comes to availability of data for specific data points. Because if the data is only available when there is a donor project, then that means when the project is done, that funding that data pipeline uh, cuts off. You know, so domestic resources are a very important part of making sure that that uh, data is, is available. Um, so I'll, I'll let you unpack that in, in the report and in the global synthesis. Um, and of course, there's the issue of gender data um, uh, use. Um, I think what we found in many places is because some of this data is coming in from a, a flash and burn type of situations in our project, that started and ended a, a program that's that only focused on a specific area um, and, and whatnot. And then you find that you have data that's not granular enough. If, you, if you're working in a region where um, you have a, a geographical uh, location that has you know, a, a large square kilometer area, uh, the, the realities in one area might not be the same in another due to cultural changes, geography, um, urbanization, et cetera. So if you do not have data that allows you to unpack the realities and nuances at that level, then you miss out um, on an entire population, an entire context. So gender data that is not granular enough can still have to be the norm. Um, and that's, that's an area that, that, uh, that needs to be looked at a great deal. And of course, we have issues around formats 
is the scanned document, is it an actual machine readable data set. Uh, the, 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 the variance there is, is, is wild. Um, so there's a need uh, to work together around the standard, around, uh, around norms for how data is, is made available. And of course, if you, do have, if you do have domestic financing, then that data becomes more uh, sustainable and continuous. Um, and just as a bonus issue, remember I, I spoke about the work we're talking about on maturity. If uh, we're assuming that the data is there, when you go into some of these governments and you're trying to push for them to open up the data, you find sometimes they don't even know that the data exists. Because the, the way that it exists in these governments means that in many instances, the government doesn't know what the government knows. So the data is in attachments on people's emails, it's on flash drives, it's on personal computers, it's on personal Google drives. So the, the likelihood that one department will know that uh, this other, this data exists in another department is very low. And in many instances, you have to put a specific individual to look for that data. And that's just within. If you step outside of government, the likelihood that you and I will know what that government has in terms of gender data when they don't have a portal, they don't have infrastructure, they don't have any of this, it'll go down to um, intuition and luck. Um, and that's that's something that uh, we've identified as a major as a major concern. So although we looked at a small sample of subnational governments in Kenya, it does seem to track at the national level and also track across across uh, across uh, countries in in sub-Saharan Africa, especially anecdotally. And finally, you, uh, yes, I, we have only one minute left. So sorry. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, but the, the the coordinating mechanisms um, for for data exist in many countries because of the work that's been done around development of statistics. Working groups, sector working groups, etc., um, exist. A lot of work has been done around around issues of women's rights. So there's a lot of coordination that happens there. Um, so in this in this area, um, the coordination can now be a platform that allows for greater engagement and scale up. Uh, so that's one one of the areas that that uh, that the sector is doing really well. In. Um, so these are the general recommendations that we've been uh, uh, putting out and that we are chasing for better governance, better infrastructure, investments in human resource, uh, and of course, making sure that a lot of those investments are coming for do from domestic sources so they can be more sustainable and, and, uh, and, and have more continuity across time. So that's all. Uh, thank you for your patience. Um, I am I'm putting the, the, the link in the chat. Uh, please do, have, uh, do take the time to have a look. Uh, both reports are linked to there, the global and the regional. Um, and yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mushiri, for your presentation. And sorry for for rushing you a little bit. Uh, and thank you for also sharing the resources in in the chat. It's going to be very useful to look at them. Uh, I think it was very interesting. Uh, the part about the challenges you shared on funding, on coordination, and also the highlight how you highlighted the importance of gender data for decision making. So thank you so much for your presentation. And now we are going with our last speaker. Uh, her name is Bobina. He's she's an, an interdisciplinary data and digital rights researcher at Policy. In her work, she currently focuses on researching data governance as well as the development, adoption, and deployment of artificial intelligence of the African continent and how that particularly affects African women. In this, she specifically tackles issues of ethics, human digital rights, justice, decoloniality, policy, intersectionality, and other Afro-feminist data and digital ideals. She's going to share with us her presentation, the need for Afrofeminist AI as a path to more equitable AI systems. Thank you so much, Bobina, and the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. I'm very cognizant of the time, and so I'm just going to wrap it up. I think I've decided to pivot my conversation just because of the time I have left. And just listening to what everyone has been sharing, uh, Mushiri, it's very interesting to hear about the work you've been doing. We just put out a report on gender data as well from a feminist perspective, which builds very much on a lot of the things you're saying. Leticia, it's very interesting to hear what you are sharing with what you're building with the gender. I think we are doing something similar with the, the OGP Secretariat in Kenya and trying to see how gender data is being used to influence inclusive digital governance. But uh, it would be very interesting to learn from you and just see what's happening in there because the challenges are uh, we're already seeing when it comes to just being able to open up that data, et cetera. But very nice to hear from you all. Uh, I think for me, just 
to very quickly wrap this up would be, I have just been, you know, uh, at the intersection of the work we're doing at policy, uh, which is um, basically looking at data tech and how those impact society and open data, which is the conversation here. I, I think I've just been thinking to myself, um, what, what is the state of open data in Africa? And, um, you know, where, where are we with open data as, as a whole? And is it something that we seem to be interested in right now as a continent? So I was looking through the open, the, 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 the charters website and I was just looking at uh, signatories and who's partaking in this and that. And I think it leaves a lot to just, um, you know, paint a picture of if, a lot of so, for example, there is the 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 six um, inclusive. I mean, the six open data principles. So it speaks to issues of, uh, for example, inclusive development, etc. Um, you know, accessibility, etc. Et et and I think from the work that we do, I have just been asking myself, which is you know primarily through an Afro feminist lens, we we have we ask ourselves these broad aspirations that we have through open data. What open data can do for our communities, our society. Is it, are these contextualized to meet the, the needs and realities of different communities? So for example, that is, you know, broadly explore, explored in our work through the idea of intersectionality, you know, people have dissecting needs and realities, they're, they're very diverse needs. And so to just come and, for example, make the assumption that just having open data would bring about inclusive um, inclusive development is just an assumption that that lacks context and nuance, like uh, a lot of the speakers before were speaking to that. Um, and just, you know, to build on that then comes in also the idea of very broadly, I think when you look at, uh, we had well, an interview recently with one of the people we're doing, we're speaking to in our research, and they did mention that something that has been happening where we've seen open data regressing in governments here is because they feel, for example, that the data is, um, when they open up the data, it is taken by uh, persons from across the globe, and then it is repurposed and brought back as products that are sold to them. And for me, I think that was a very telling thing because it speaks to the 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 geopolitics and the power dynamics that play when it comes to open data i don't think we speak to that enough and so the decoloniality conversation i think comes in there very strongly you know we can speak to for example you know uh when you look at a lot of the conversation around ai for example on the continent has been do we have available availability of data sets on the continent but if big tech comes in they're able to get the data sets but local developers are not able to get the data sets why because of the power that they they, they wield you know in this in this space uh, we could also look at governments. Are governments willing, again, for example, like Leticia was, was sharing, are governments willing to share their data with the public or with developers? So I, I think for us, the question is very much around power dynamics and how and how we are able to address those power dynamics when it comes to data ecosystems. And um, so for us, that's where the conversation then finally of, um, of gender data comes in because we look at gender data as a framework that can be used to by persons working with data to basically um, untangle and undo power and uh, bias and power dynamics within data ecosystems. So the data ecosystems are not free without, are not free of bias like we've seen, they're not free of prejudice. And so to be able to do away with that, we have to look at, you know, to do this critical analysis and look at instances where data, I mean, where bias uh, seeps into these ecosystems. So for, for example, we were um, with the gender data work that I mentioned we've been doing previously, it's actually published a few weeks ago, um, we mapped uh, in the four countries we were studying the state of gender data, and we found some things that were interesting, and I thought I could just stop on that note in, with my sharing. One, we found uh, computational data seems to have this, um, it's been given a more superior sort of um, position in compared to more indigenous forms of data, and then looking again at the issue of open data here, where, where do you find open data on the African continent? Do you find it in computational uh, systems and and um, that space where where we have you know we still have a digital divide and things like that uh, we saw issues to do with for example neoliberal feminisms where we're told to make a case for um you know where gender bias exists in at the national decision making level for example uh we have seen studies where you know a, a, a cost cost case has been made for, you know, this is how much uh, the government loses when we have violence against women. And, I, you know, uh, that again paints the picture. This is where 
bias comes in when we're looking at now how to start unpacking gender data, because why is that the approach we're taking to approach a social justice issue? Uh, we looked at, for example, among uh, still under that state, we looked at the issue to do with the growing, uh, there is this growing opposition to gender equality across the continent. And I think globally we, we've seen it from COVID where there is this popular movement against just gender equality, the gender equality movement or feminist movement. And again, that tells us that this is where, so this is just me trying to say that we, we then have the opportunity to look at open data from a more critical stance and look at how do we indeed have open data that promotes this sustainable development we're talking about without us just using these broad aspirations and terms that are not contextualized to the different um, communities and societies across the globe. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to have a uh, chat with anyone outside of this and share more about our work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bobina. I think it's it's been really interesting to 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 close the, the session with, with your thoughts. I totally agree that we need to 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 give a context for 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 open data and, and thanks for bringing up this intersectional view between be, between different different topics AI data trying to to have a gender lens to see what's what's going on trying to see what communities are producing that data the geopolitical view too and and also try to to generate awareness on how we can address uh, biases and prejudices in in the data we are we are working on, it has been really really interesting. Thank you so much for that. We I'm really sorry. I think that maybe this session should be a little bit longer. What we we are getting to an end. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to for a for for an open discussion, but we really wanted to make sure that this session had four speakers too from each region and we what we wanted to go from between different projects we we heard about a project on of a governmental project on on a data inventory we heard about the balance on data protection and access to information in a specific topics like re recovery funds on or the beneficial ownership we heard about a project of political uh, will on gender data in Africa, and we heard uh, the thoughts that Bobina from Policy uh, shared with us, and this inter intersectional view uh, and and the mix between AI and the importance of of data for for AI systems. So I think it has been really insightful. I'm going to share in the in the chat a few a few links. Uh, here's our email. So. If anyone wants to keep going on with the conversation or has some question that hasn't been answered, you can reach at us. And also we are going to be sharing the presentation of our speakers with our network. Also in the, there's a link of Eventbrite for our next session that is going to happen next week. It's focused on the Asia and Pacific region. So we are happy to, to host you next week too. And also I'm sharing the calendar of events. We have an open calendar of events from Open Data Charter where you, you can find our events and also, also you can upload your events and to share them with the community. So I would like to, to really, really thank our speakers again for being with us. Sorry if I had to rush you a little bit. <laughs> uh, I think we, we, we should take some lessons and maybe maybe we can make a, a longer edition next year. And thank you to all the participants who have been here the whole session here in, to us. So thank you so much, everyone, and hoping to meet you soon. Thank Until you, next gracias. Time. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.